Hello, and thank you for joining the Polar Bears International Tundra Connection webcast today. My name is Alisa McCall, and I'm a staff scientist and the director of conservation outreach at Polar Bears International. I'm so thrilled to talk to you today with our webcast titled One Bear, Two Worlds. And we have a special guest that I'll introduce to you in just a moment. And today we'll be talking about all sorts of things to do with habitat and adaptations with polar bears. And we cannot wait to hear your questions. So if you have a question about something we're talking about today, please let us know. There's a couple ways you can do that. If you are watching on our website, polarbearsinternational.org, you can put your question in the chat box below the window, or you can email us using questions at pbears.org. That's questions at pbears.org. And we have a team of moderators watching for your questions and sending them to me live. So we'll try to get to as many questions as we can today. And again, we're so thrilled to have you. We're going to speak for between 30 and 40 minutes today, depending on questions. So let's dive right in. I'm coming to you live from Whitehorse, Yukon, where I live, but I'm heading up to Churchill in just a couple days, and you will see behind me a live polar bear in Churchill. So we have our team at Polar Bears International. They've been out on the tundra in Tundra 1, roaming already for days, and they'll continue to roam for about the next month looking for polar bears with our live polar bear cam that you can either watch on our website or on explore.org. And these bears are hunkering down right now, a little bit lazy. We're gonna talk about that a bit later in this broadcast, but you can see a polar bear sleeping behind me, which is really exciting. And that is happening right now. But let's pop over to a different part of the world where our guest today, Dr. John Whiteman is. Hi, John, thank you so much for being here. Could you please give a little introduction of yourself and where you are and what you do? Sure thing. I'm very excited to be here as well. Thanks for having me. Um, uh, as she said, my name is John Whiteman. I'm a professor at Old Dominion University. So you could say that means that I teach the 15th grade or so. Um, and I am coming to you from Virginia. Uh, I live very close to the coast um, down here in Virginia and very close to the beach. So I'm in an area pretty far from polar bears right now. That's for sure. Your habitat probably looks a lot different than a polar bear's habitat. And same with me. We all live in different habitats. John, what is a habitat? So I think one way to conceive of a habitat um, is you could say it's kind of like the places um, that you spend all of your time and the places where you get everything you need on a daily basis. So for a human, I think you could say your habitat would include your house, like I'm in my house right now. It would include the grocery store where you go to get your food, uh, maybe restaurants where you go to get your food. It could include your school, uh, maybe some city parks or other places that you go to on a regular basis. It's basically all the physical places and physical stuff that you need. Thank you for that. And I think that's a really good exercise. So maybe with your class and to yourself, you can sit and think for a minute about what your own habitat looks like. What's going on in your environment? What does your day to day look like? It's a really interesting thing to think about. And it looks different for a lot of us. And it looks different for different species of animals. And we're going to speak about that now. Now, there's different ways that animals live in their habitats and they change to suit their habitats to take advantage of that. And these are called adaptations. So every animal has certain things they do or traits they have that help them live in their habitat. And there's a lot of different examples of adaptations from different species. So some species live in the water, some live on land, and some live on both. So what is an animal that lives just in the water? Maybe a fish? What kind of adaptations do fish have? Well, they've got gills that help them breathe air underwater basically, but what kind of animals live in the water and on land? Can you think about that for a second? Do you have any examples in your mind about an animal that can live in water and on land? How about you, John? Do you know any animals that can live in both worlds? Oh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm very sorry. I lost your audio for just about a minute there, oh, so I don't know no if you worries. asked me something. I think, <laughs> no worries. I think I lost audio too. So we we're just so I was just talking about animals that can live in two worlds. So some animals live just in the water mm -hmm. and some live just on land, but some animals can live just in two worlds. 
one example of an animal that can live in two worlds is an amphibian. So do you know what an amphibian or what is an amphibian? John, could you tell the audience? Sure. So an amphibian is an animal that um, you may have heard the word amphibious before. And that word kind of generally means to something that can move between the land and the water. So maybe you've heard of like an amphibious vehicle. And that's a vehicle that looks like a boat. It can drive around in the water, but it also has wheels that stick out the bottom. So you get out of the water right up onto the land. So an amphibian is the, the animal version of that. So it's an animal that can be very, very comfortable and spend a lot of time in the water, but it can also spend a lot of time on land. Um, so it really is an animal that can move back and forth between both of those worlds pretty easily. Right, and a great example would be a frog. But one thing about amphibians is that to give birth, they lay eggs. They are not considered a mammal. They are a, their own class there. So when we think about mammals that can live in both worlds, the, the pool of options gets a little bit smaller. Now mammals give birth to live young, they give their young milk, and there's a handful of mammals out there that span both of these worlds. And one of those mammals is an otter. And John, earlier this year, uh, you wrote, a um, part of a paper that was part of a bigger book about comparing or just showing otters and polar bears. And I thought it was so interesting because I had never thought of it in kind of the same idea, but otters are another animal that spend time both in the water and out. And I was wondering if you could maybe mention an adaptation that otters have that helps them do both. Sure thing. Uh, so otters are really cool critters. They're a lot smaller than polar bears, but just like polar bears, they spend a lot of time both in the water and on land. So one of the things that I would talk about with otters, and I'll bring this up because later we can talk about how this is actually a little bit different with polar bears, is that otters, when they go in the water, you may, maybe you've experienced this when you've gone swimming. So on a, on a warm day, when you go swimming in a lake or a river or maybe the ocean, even if it's pretty warm out, it's easy to get a little bit chilled when you're in the water. And that's just because water is really good at absorbing heat. So if you go swimming in water, even if the water is kind of warm, it's pretty easy to accidentally get too cold. So animals that spend a lot of time in the water need to be very careful to make sure they don't get too cold. The way that sea otters do this, um, it's really cool. So when they go into the water, the first thing that they do is they take their claws and they brush their fur. Um, and you can see them if you ever want to see uh, otters in real life at a zoo or something like that, or out in the wild, you can see them really carefully brushing and arranging their fur. And they do that a lot. And when they're doing that, what they're doing is actually taking the hairs of their fur and they're lining them up just perfectly. Like on a, like if you took a microscope, you could see the hairs being lined up just perfectly. And it ends up making a waterproof little layer inside their fur. And that waterproof little layer prevents their skin from ever coming into contact with the water. So even though the otters are swimming around in the water, their skin is actually protected by the fur. And so they don't lose very much heat to the water. And so that helps them stay warm, even when they're swimming in places where if you or I were to go swimming, we would get very cold in the water very quickly. That is an amazing example of an adaptation helping an animal live in the water. And that is so cool. I didn't know that. I think another really cool thing when we're comparing otters bears is how long they can hold their breath. So John mentioned that, of course, otters are a lot smaller than polar bears. But did you know that on wreck, otters can actually hold their breath a little bit longer than polar bears? The longest time we have recorded of a polar bear holding its breath is three minutes and seconds. And otters can hold their breath for more like three minutes and 40 seconds, even a little bit more. So that's pretty interesting that they can hold their breath even more. But otters have to find more food in the water. They have to spend longer foraging underwater. Whereas polar bears, actually, though they rely on the ocean to get their food, they're spending their time hunting above water. And so we're going to talk a little bit about polar bears now. So polar bears are such a special example of an animal that can span both worlds because, of course, they are a bear. And there are eight bear species around the world. And John actually studies a few of them. So if you've got questions about other bears, you could ask him. But polar bears are the only marine bear. So they are so tied to the ocean because of the frozen sea ice on top of the ocean. Polar bears use Arctic sea ice as a platform on which to hunt their main prey, seals. 
Now, polar bears need seal blubber to survive. That is their number one main food. John, could you talk a little bit about polar bear food and why they need to eat blubber and get all those calories? Sure thing. So when you think of a bear that might hunt another animal and then catch it and then eat it for food, there's kind of two pieces of the animal you can think about. One is the fat on the animal. Um, and for seals, they have a lot of fat. Um, they have a really thick layer of fat underneath their skin that helps them keep, keep warm. So kind of how sea otters use their uh, fur to keep themselves waterproof. A lot of seals, they don't do that. Instead, they let their skin come into contact with the water, but they have a really thick layer of fat below the skin that acts kind of like insulation, almost like a winter jacket. Um, so there's the fat in a, in a meal, and then there's also the non-fat stuff, basically the muscle. Like if you were to sit down and eat a steak dinner or a burger, you'd be just eating the muscle part. It turns out that the fat is about, uh, it has about twice as much energy in it. Um, so if a polar bear catches a seal and it's able to start eating the seal, the first thing it's going to want to eat is the fat because the fat offers twice as much energy. Every bite that the polar bear takes of that seal, um, is especially the fat, it's going to get a lot more energy out of that meal. So to keep it efficient in terms of how many seals the polar bear needs to catch to be able to um, feed its appetite, uh, it makes a lot of sense for the polar bear to mostly eat the fat on the seals. So I've heard polar bears referred to as being hyper carnivorous or even lipovores. And that is mm -hmm. really pointing to the fact that polar bears do rely on the seal blubber because of the energy, just like John was saying. In fact, they need to eat more fat than any other bear species, and they eat less meat and less carbohydrates than any other bear species as well. Their body has adapted, it has many adaptations to eat and process this seal blubber. And of course they have many adaptations to live in the Arctic as one would need. So I live up north, I live in the Canadian North and I have for quite a while. And when the winter hits here, I kind of have these short term as they're not really adaptations, but I put on my parka and my toque and my mukluks and I go outside and I try to keep warm, but polar bears, of course, don't need parkas. They have built in adaptations to help them live in the Arctic. So we're going to go through a couple other polar bear adaptations that help them live in the cold and find their seals and eat their food. So if you think for a moment, though, in your classroom, think about a polar bear. What does a polar bear look like? What are some adaptations you might need to live in the Arctic? What might a polar bear might need? Hmm. The fur. Let's talk about the fur for a minute. And John kind of mentioned the fur. John, are you okay? Can you talk about polar bear fur for a second? And I also have a piece of it that I can show. But what is special about sure polar thing. bear fur? So if, um, if everybody listening and watching right now could think for just a moment about times that you've stepped outside and the coldest weather that you've ever been in. So picture yourself walking out into that weather and without a jacket on and think to yourself, how long could I stay outside before I started to shiver? Now, shivering is a really important thing that we mammals do because we need to keep our body temperatures warm. So when we're outside in the cold, we end up shivering after a certain amount of time because we need to stay warm. And the activity from the shivering helps us stay warm. Polar bear fur has two layers to it. Um, an outer layer that's kind of coarse and it's tough and the fur is very long. And then it's got an inner layer that is really, really thick. The fur is relatively short on the inner layer, but it's really packed in at a high density on the skin. And it covers all of the skin of the polar bear. And so their fur provides, does a really good job of insulating them from the air. And so you can think of the fur as kind of the jacket that they wear when they're walking around outside. Now, I don't know about you, but when I think of walking outside, I think, boy, if it's 30 degrees Fahrenheit or maybe around zero Celsius, if I'm outside for a while, I'll probably start to shiver. Well, scientists have studied shivering in polar bears, and so far we don't know how cold it needs to get before a polar bear starts shivering. We know that polar bear fur keeps them so warm that, let's see, they, polar bears have been observed as cold as minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit, so 20 degrees below zero Fahrenheit or around minus 30 degrees Celsius. 
And those polar bears were hanging out outside and they were happy. They were not shivering. So polar bears, their fur allows them to stay warm, which makes them really well adapted to their habitat in the Arctic. That is so interesting about shivering. I sure shiver when it's that cold, even if I am wearing all that gear. Now I have an example of polar bear fur right here. And of course you could see that polar bear on your screen earlier. That again is a live polar bear having a nap in the willows. Uh, but this polar bear fur here, you can see, of course, polar bears, they look white. And this helps them blend in with the Arctic sea ice environment and likely helps them sneak up on seals on the sea ice, blending into that ice. But polar bear fur is actually clear and well, it's transparent. So it just looks white to our eyes, but it really picks up light around them. It's also largely hollow, which probably helps trap warm air in the fur and against their bodies, keeping them a little bit warm. So you can see they've got all sorts of adaptations to help keep them warm in the Arctic. And they have a few adaptations that help them walk across Arctic sea ice. Now, Arctic sea ice is not your average frozen lake ice. It's not simply just a hunk of frozen water. Because sea ice is salty, when it freezes, it has all these cracks and crevices in it. And it actually forms the base of the food chain in the Arctic. We like to say that Arctic sea ice is to the ocean what soil is to a forest. So because these tiny little plants like algae are growing in the Arctic sea ice and they're feeding little diatoms and copepods, little creatures that are feeding the fish that feed the seals that feed the polar bears. Arctic sea ice is very, very cool. But it's not just one big chunk. It is moving all the time. And so polar bears kind of have this treadmill situation. They're walking out on the ice and they have to navigate where they're moving all the time and and though they can swim amazingly well swimming can be energetically costly it costs a lot of energy to swim really far so they need to have feet that are very well suited to walking on the ice and john i was wondering if you could talk a little bit about polar bear claws and feet and why they're so suited for arctic sea ice sure thing so polar bears are um, on average they're the biggest of the eight bear species that she mentioned at the beginning there so there's eight different bears in the world and polar bears are usually the uh, if you take an average bear they're going to be by far the biggest but what's interesting about their claws is they don't actually have the biggest claws there are some other bear species that have really big claws for example, some bears that are really well adapted for a habitat on land, and so their claws are really big and they're good at digging to get at food buried down in the dirt. Um, for polar bears, they don't really need to dig like that, but they do need to catch really slippery seals, and they need to make sure that they have good traction on sea ice. So as a result, they have these claws that are a little bit shorter than you would expect for a bear this big. I mean, they're still pretty big, but they're not as big as you would expect. And they're pretty well curved and they come to a pretty sharp point. So they're kind of like little hooks. And so there are these little hooks that help them keep traction on the sea ice as they're walking and probably help them grab really slippery seals when they're hunting as well. And the surface, the foot pads of the bears are also really rough. If you were to put that foot pad underneath a microscope, you would see all these little ridges and little bumps. And that probably helps them keep traction as well. So you can think of if you have a cat or a dog at home, you could look at the foot pads and they're the same kind of foot pads on polar bears, but they're particularly rough, again, to help them keep a good grip on the ice. Definitely, kind of like built-in winter tires. So you can see the bear yeah. behind me woke up. Okay, so based on what John was saying, he talked about the claws a little bit. So I've got two claws here with me, and I'm gonna give you a few seconds to guess which one is a polar bear claw. So I'm gonna hold them up in my screen. I think I'm a little small right now, and that's okay. So I have one claw on the top and one claw on the bottom, and these are from different bear species. Which one might be a polar bear claw? Hmm. It's the top one. See how thick and sharp and shorter this claw is compared to the bottom one? This bottom claw is a brown bear or a grizzly bear claw. So longer, more suited for terrestrial environments for being on land and digging, just like John said. So you can see these differences play out and we can see adaptations in animals that help them live where they are. So we are getting questions coming in. Thank you so much. We'll get to more in just a moment. Thank you for the shout out from Mrs. Larson's third grade class. They tagged us at polar bears on Twitter. Really appreciate it. Also hashtag polar bears. Nice to see you guys. Thanks for joining today. And we are also getting questions of course about, okay, We've been talking about polar bears on sea ice, hunting seals, that's great. But this polar bear is on land. 
why are these polar bears on land then? And that's kind of the crux of it today. Polar bears can spend time on land and they have adapted to do so. So this polar bear right now in Churchill, Manitoba is part of what we call the Western Hudson Bay subpopulation of polar bears. So polar bears live around the Arctic and there are multiple different subpopulations that we've broken them up to to help us manage them. And this bear in Hudson Bay in Canada um, is part of the seasonal sea ice eco region. So that means that see Hudson Bay right there, you can see where Churchill is on your screen, you see the pink Churchill dot. So that big body of water that Churchill's on, that is Hudson Bay. And Hudson Bay is not frozen year round. Even though it's home to three different groups of polar bears, three different subpopulations, there's no sea ice on Hudson Bay in the summer. It completely melts in the summer and all those polar bears come onto land. Now, pretty soon, hopefully next month, at least into December, those polar bears are moving to the coast because that sea ice is gonna freeze up again and all the bears will be gone sometimes almost overnight, it seems like. As soon as the sea ice is back, those bears leave land and they head out to go hunt those seals and get that blubber. But all summer long, they're kind of just hanging out. They don't have access to seals. They're just relying on their own body fat. And some of John's work really looked at how polar bears have adapted to these times of less food. We used to think that maybe they kind of go into some sort of hibernation stage because other bear species do. Right now across North America, brown bears and black bears are getting ready to head into their dens to hibernate, but we don't see that in polar bears. So John, I was hoping you could talk a little bit about how polar bears deal with these periods of less food. How are they staying on land this long? Sure thing. So um, you may, if you could think about other bear species that you may have heard of that do this thing called hibernation in the winter. Um, so for example, there are a lot of black bears in North America, which is a different species of bear than polar bear. And what a black bear does in most places is right about this time of year in autumn, it eats a whole lot. It builds up a lot of body fat to store a lot of energy. And then it will go into a den and it will stop eating, it will stop drinking, and it will spend maybe up to six months in that den, um, not doing anything and just living off of all that stored energy from everything it ate during this time of the year. And so a long time ago, um, researchers were up in the Arctic. They were actually in the same place where the tundra buggy footage is coming from. And they were watching polar bears and they thought, you know, polar bears, in the, we know that they hunt from the sea ice and we know the sea ice melts and goes away during the summer. Maybe polar bears do the same kind of hibernation like thing, like a black bear, but they just do it during the summer. Um, and so it took a long time to be able to go out and take some measurements and try and figure out if that was the case. And so that's one of the things that um, I did. I went up not to the place where the footage is from right now, but to a different place in northern Alaska. And we went out and we captured polar bears in the summer and we took some blood samples. We took some breath samples. Um, we put little collars on the bears so we could follow them and then recapture them at, at a later time. And we, we looked at a lot of different aspects of how their bodies work and about what the kind of food. That, and what we found out was a little bit surprising. It turns out that during the summer, polar bears don't really go into a hibernation like a bear does in the winter. But instead, they basically go into a mode of just being pretty hungry and kind of slowing down a little bit over the summer, bringing their activity down because they're getting really hungry and they're waiting for the opportunity to start eating again. So their response in terms of how their body works is kind of what you and I would go through if we were to stop eating. Now, it would be hard for us to eat enough to put on enough stored fat so we could go a long time without eating. So, you know, I don't advise it. I don't think we could, you know, this wouldn't be a good idea for us to do. But if we could put on a lot of stored energy and then just stop eating, um, we would find that we're, really, we're hungry, we're looking for food, our metabolism is still going, we're burning our stored energy at a pretty quick rate still. Um, and that's what a polar bear is doing during the summer. So they're waiting, um, but they're, uh, they're, they're just hanging out on shore. They're not doing a whole lot, but this whole time, they're still pretty hungry and they're pretty eager to get back out on the sea ice hunting again. So John, so polar bears are on land and they, they can survive on their own fat for a while, but why don't they simply change what they eat? Why can't they, for example, go eat some caribou, learn to hunt caribou or just survive on berries or eggs on land? Mm -hmm. 
That's a great question. So you might, you know, you can look at the footage right now and you see that polar bear wandering around and you see some plants there. And although you can't see them, you can think, oh, there's got to be some caribou up there or maybe there's some birds or bird eggs. And sure enough, researchers have spent a lot of time up in the Arctic and they've watched polar bears. And if you watch polar bears long enough, you might see one of them eat a caribou or you might see one of them eat some bird eggs or eat some birds, or it's pretty common to see them eating vegetation. However, there's a problem with that. The first problem is basically there's just not enough of those alternative kind of foods to uh, really meet a polar bear's appetite. And one of the ways that you can see the consequences of this actually is that there are other bears that are well adapted for living in the terrestrial environment on shore. Those are brown bears, also called grizzly bears. And those bears already live in this kind of tundra habitat. So there are other bears that are already present in that area that spend all their time on shore. And those bears that are already on shore um, are some of the smallest bears that you can find of those species. Um, so in Alaska, which is where I've spent a little bit more time than over in Canada, we know that the pol that, uh, polar bears, when they spend time on shore in the summer, those polar bears, an average male probably weighs somewhere around 1,000 pounds or 450 kilograms or so. Um, in contrast, the bears that live on shore in that environment and have to live off of the shore-based food all the time, that average male weighs more like 200 pounds, maybe 250 pounds, and that's maybe 100 to 150 kilograms. So, you know, like one fourth of the size, they're much, much smaller than polar bears. And they're so much smaller because that reflects that there's just not very much food. So there is a little bit of food there and polar bears will eat it, but it's not nearly enough to support um, their really big appetites. Another really interesting thing about the most common food source up there, which is the vegetation and polar bears will eat vegetation, is that polar bears have become so well adapted for catching and eating seals that the shape of their teeth and the shape of their skull has actually changed over time. And it's become a little bit specialized for, for example, um, pouncing down into the snow where a seal might be hiding and sticking their face in there to be able to grab the seal. And the shape of the skull has changed, the shape of the teeth has changed. Those changes have actually made their skull and their teeth um, not very good at chewing vegetation. So if you can picture eating a dinner, you know, uh, one of the hardest things that you need to chew during dinner might be celery, might be carrots, uh, might be basically the stuff in a salad. Vegetation, it turns out, is the most difficult stuff to chew. And so animals that primarily live off of vegetation tend to have really big, strong jaws and really big, strong back teeth um, that allows them to do a really good job of chewing up tough vegetation before they swallow it. Polar bears don't have that anymore. Instead, they have these uh, uh, teeth and um, teeth, jaws and skulls that are good at helping catch a seal, but then they're, they're not very good at chewing. All they're good at at that point is tearing off a little bit of that soft fat from a seal and then swallowing it. Really interesting. You use the word specialized again, which we've said a few times this webcast, and that's so true. Polar bears are so specialized for their Arctic sea ice habitat and for eating seal blubber. And that's why we are concerned about polar bears when it comes to climate change, because climate change is affecting the polar bear sea ice habitat. And we have a video to show you about what's going on with polar bears. Now, now as you're watching on your screen here, these, again, Western Hudson Bay polar bears, they are already spending about four weeks on land than the polar bears here did just a few decades ago. So things are changing. Polar bears are spending longer periods of time on land, and this is an issue, and we know it's tied to climate change. So we're going to queue up this video right now so you can see what's going on. Climate change is already affecting some populations of polar bears. Since we get most of our energy from fossil fuels, we are producing huge amounts of carbon dioxide. You see, regular amounts of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere act like a blanket around the Earth trapping heat and keeping our planet at a stable temperature. However, when we burn fossil fuels like coal, oil, and natural gas for energy, we pump rampant amounts of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. This buildup thickens the blanket, trapping too much heat, disrupting the climate, and melting Arctic sea ice. 
Great, so that's pretty straightforward. We're trapping heat in the atmosphere and that's changing Arctic sea ice. Now we are seeing different areas of the polar bears range change at different rates, but we know in areas where sea ice has changed dramatically like Hudson Bay, we've seen declines in polar bears. So there are fewer polar bears here than there used to be. They're smaller than they used to be and they're having fewer cubs. The good news is we have the solutions. We just need to roll them out at a bigger level. So we need to shift to more renewable energy sources like solar and wind. We need to be more efficient with the fuel we are burning. And the biggest thing you can do, especially as students, the biggest thing we can all do is talk about it. Talk about it with our peers, our friends, our families, our leaders in our communities. And when you're old enough, you can vote. But even if you can't vote, you can still have your voice be heard. Everything we do for polar bears right now is really what we're doing for our own future. We have a shared future together on this planet and it can be stable and bright if we work together now to enact these community level solutions that move us toward better energy sources, cleaner energy sources. So we have a couple more questions coming in and then we're gonna wrap up and then play another video right at the very end. So John, I'm gonna throw a couple questions at you. This one is sure. interesting. Is it true that polar bears can stay hydrated from just eating fat and not drinking water? Oh, that, whoever asked that question, I love that question. Um, <laughs> and it's a good one. And the short answer is we don't know. And the longer answer is uh, whoever you are, you should um, uh, finish your education and become a researcher and find out for us. <laughs> So here's the thing about it. Um, in the Arctic, especially uh, during the winter months, um, everything is frozen, right? Now, as was mentioned before, when sea ice freezes, it rejects a lot of the salt and other stuff in the ocean. And so you end up with ice and with snow that is actually pretty pure. It's basically fresh water. But it costs a lot of energy to melt that snow and ice. So a polar bear could get water by eating snow and ice, but it's gonna cost it a lot of energy. It's gonna to have to take it in its mouth and then warm it up a lot and then drink and then swallow the water. So that's a little bit hard to do. The other interesting thing is that when polar bears eat fat, um, as they're burning that fat for energy, one of the byproducts of burning that fat for energy is actually water. So they're making their own water and all animals do this actually. We make our own little, we make our own water as well. So you could think of every animal as its own little water factory. The thing is you don't make a lot of water. You make some, so for humans, something like around five, maybe 10% of our total water that we need comes from the water that we make. We don't yet have a really good sense of what percent of water that polar bears get comes from the water that they make. Burning fat, because it's, it has such a high energy density, does let you make a lot of water, um, but we just don't quite know yet. If I had to take a guess, my guess would be that um, no, they probably can't get by without taking in at least some water from the environment. Um, but we don't quite know yet. Well, thank you for that question and answer. And just one more question. This is a nice one to end on. People always ask and like to know, how old do polar bears get? How long are they <laughs> living out there in the <laughs> Arctic? It's kind of a harsh life, it seems like. It is. It's, it's a pretty challenging life out there. Um, let's see. I think on average, um, in the wild, life is a little bit harsher for male polar bears than it is for female polar bears because the males tend to fight with each other um, to have the opportunity to breed and to have uh, uh, cubs. And so the males are fighting with each other over that. And so sometimes they can hurt each other, sometimes to the point where they might die and might not survive. Females don't do as much. So I I think, and I'm not sure, maybe you have a better number for this than I do, but I think most males live um, to be into their early 20s or so, and most females would be more like the mid to the late 20s. In zoos, they've lived longer than that for sure, but they don't have to deal with all the challenges that wild animals do in zoos. Yeah, that's exactly right. And the, the oldest polar bear we know of in a zoo lived to be 42 years old, and she lived in Winnipeg, actually. So 
But yep, the wild is a lot harsher, but luckily polar bears have adaptations that help them live and survive and hopefully thrive across the Arctic. So thank you so much for your questions today. We're gonna wrap up with a couple great messages. First of all, we wanna thank our sponsors that are helping us bring live polar bears to you. Again, this polar bear sleeping behind me is a live bear. You can either watch the cams on our website, polarbearsinternational.org or on explore.org. And we would also love to thank Frontiers North Adventures. They are a wonderful partner that loan us Buggy One every single year. So Tundra Buggy One is the vehicle on which this polar bear cam is mounted. There's a few polar bear cams around the Tundra, but this is the one that moves around to help us find the polar bears. Tundra Buggy One is an incredible mobile roving studio basically and you might be able to have your very own if we can get a lego kit made of buggy one so you might see links this fall on our lego buggy one kit that we need supporters to get it over the finish line how fun would that be if you are a teacher or parent i would just like to remind you that we have curriculum on our website and we have some new curriculum created through the Alaska Pacific University, I believe. It is really fabulous, grades three to five. If you'd like to check it out, please do. And there's also a feedback survey that you can take after this broadcast. You should see the link maybe in the window below right now or even email to you. And if you fill out this feedback survey, you will be entered to win one of three polar bear adoptions. So thank you so much in advance. That really helps us inform our programming. Thank you to John for joining us today, all the way from Virginia. Very much appreciate it. And thank you to all the viewers. Please remember to follow your curiosity and ask questions. We are going to be here for the next month. We're going to have multiple webcasts, live chats. You can email us anytime or message us um, on our webpage there. So please let us know what you want to know about polar bears. And we're so thrilled to bring them to you for the rest of the season. So. Thank you, John. Thanks, everyone. And we're going to end with a solutions video on how you can help us conserve polar bears in the Arctic. Future generations of people and polar bears depend on the decisions and plans that we make today. The key to getting the climate back to functioning the Thank way it should you. and to preserving the future for like polar bears right across the Arctic very, very is to there. move away from using fossil fuels for energy yeah. altogether. The most important thing we can do is vote with the climate in mind to let our leaders know we support a swift transition to renewable energy sources. In the meantime, we can directly participate in and learn more about our local and regional renewable energy options. We can all make a difference outside our own households by influencing where our energy comes from. We hope you leave here feeling inspired and return home to leverage your voice and your influence. Because together, we can make sure that polar bears roam the Arctic sea ice for generations to come.